Okay, so um, good afternoon. Let's assume we are in Europe, so good afternoon. And thank you for taking part to this uh, uh, thematic session. The thematic section is uh, uh, entitled uh, Industry 4.0 uh, and Cyber Physical Systems. It comes from uh, the idea of this thematic session comes from the collaboration that the Barcelona Supercomputing Center has with the um, Angura IIoT company in the Basque Country. Um, my colleague uh, Javier Diaz uh, is here from, uh, uh, from the company. And uh, yeah, the idea was to gather around people that are interested in the, say, the, the kind of problem that we are facing um, every day when we try to optimize predictive maintenance in the industry and uh, um, take advantage of HPC technology, for example, for it. So uh, I don't want to stay uh, to steal too much time. I, I would like to um, introduce uh, our say, keynote speaker and, uh, and I leave the floor to Javier. Uh, who knows him uh, very well. So welcome to the session. Uh, uh, just a word about the organization. We have a chat, I think, so you can drop questions during the talk in the chat. Um, otherwise, I think every speaker will preserve a couple of minutes at the end of the, uh, their presentation to interact with the, with the audience. Uh, saying that, uh, please Javier introduce uh, Dan. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Filippo. So I will introduce our keynote speaker, Dan Isaacs. He is by pre by vice, vice president and technical director of the Digital Twin Consortium, where he is responsible for setting the technical direction for more than 150 member consortium and liaison partnerships and support for new memberships. Uh, Dan was director of strategic marketing and business development at, at Silix where he was responsible for emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, he has been working uh, recently in the automotive business development, focused on automotive driving, driving and ADAS uh, system. Dan represented the silings to other consumption, the Industrial Internet Consortium, with, and he has more than 25 years of experience working in automotive, uh, military space and computer and consumer based companies, including Ford, NEKC, LSI, Logic, and huge craft, aircrafts. So I will just let Dan uh, to, to give us uh, his, his keynote speak, his keynote uh, regarding about the, let's say, the end of or, or the use of the data that we find in the industry or we acquire in the industry using uh, cyber physical systems uh, and how we use this data in order to, to give added value uh, and provide actionable insights to the end user. So digital twin uh, is one important part of it. So I will let Dan uh, give us more details on that during his keynote. So go ahead, Dan. Done. There we go. I was trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me okay, Javi? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for this uh, great opportunity to present uh, not only about the cyber physical systems, but really about what the Digital Twin Consortium is all about and the, the significance and the role that digital twins are playing uh, across many different industries. So we're gonna sort of we'll, we'll we'll go through some of those areas. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the importance, the significance of digital twins across cyber physical systems and and all systems in general. Uh, how high performance compute plays a key role, and then we'll talk a little bit about the consortium and just give you sort of an idea uh, in terms of what the consortium is all about and the different areas and the breadth. So again, thank you for this opportunity, and. It, this is really a, a statement saying that linking the physical to the digital worlds has just tremendous amount of economic value. And this is the goal, what they're looking at. This is 
could generate over uh, you know, there's different numbers, but it is a significant amount of, uh, of value that is generated. And I, I did some research trying to show some examples of some digital twins in the use and just how you can see the importance and the significance. This is from the European Space Agency. These collection of next slides is really Sorry. looking at, yes. Sorry, we cannot see your screen. Uh, now I'm not sharing again? Hmm. No. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Now you should be able to see. Correct. Now okay. Yeah. And you see the full screen, right? It says digital. Yes. Digital yes, Europe. Correct. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you. Abby. Thank you. And sorry so, for interruption. No, no problem at all. So, um, so this is really an example of of how digital twins are being made of the Earth itself, and you can see the need and the requirement for high performance compute, the cloud, all the rest of these areas. In fact, I believe one of the, your next uh, or, or following presenter after will be talking uh, a little bit of their area because this also involves uh, Barcelona supercompute as well as other uh, areas over in uh, uh, Europe. And here's a really great example I felt of the significance and the importance that this plays. This is in the case of uh, being able to create a digital twin of the Mediterranean itself and being able to look at this and being able to really look from the standpoint of overall analysis, this holistic analysis, being able to take real world data to being able to take that information in and look at that across the board. It, it requires, it's, you could imagine, a tremendous amount of uh, compute and to be able to do the different, understand the complex interactions of what's going on between not only the ocean, but the atmosphere and then how that is affected in terms of the different uh, climate extremes. Here's another use case of a digital twin where you have uh, a twin of the cryosphere and what it's literally looking at is the different areas in terms of the uh, water uh, bodies that we have, whether it's subglacial lakes or thermal profiles or even surface or lakes and then the dynamics involved. Again, very massive amount of data coming and being required to be processed to be able to virtualize what's happening, but all based on this real world data. And this just sort of gives you a, a scenario in terms of how high performance compute is used within this as the digital twin. You can see where all the different observations, whether it's land, sea, surface, air, coming through, being able to then acquire that data, use the high performance compute to analyze that data and be able to then essentially virtualize what's happening in real time uh, across the uh, across the world. And here you can see this concept of a digital continuum where you have the big data, you have the data analytics with the cognitive computing, and of course, key, a high performance cloud. Then the actual physical systems. So we have the virtualized model based on the real data being analyzed and then being able to represent that actual physical uh, entity. That's the concept of the twinning. You have the digital twin and being able to then take that information from those different areas. And then now we go obviously, uh, and this is very recent where a digital twin has been able to be represented in terms of some of the satellite uh, activity that's going on. And then even in the area of being able to have a virtual twin or digital twin, a virtualized model exactly analyzing all the scenarios and the performance of this. This is really important because um, this is really bringing about a, transform a transformative value to the industry, where one example was, this was a recent article that came out about a next generation air defense system that the US government had put together. And normally these take five to 10 years and they come in uh, extremely high in terms of budget and usually uh, very lengthy in being able to get through it. This time they were able to be I think it was almost 50% reduction in times of development, 50% uh, in terms of reduction in cost. And when they built the first prototype, very, very uh, rapidly, they were able to have it operate flawlessly. And, and that, that realization, the importance of the high performance compute to be able to analyze all the different parameters, the different scenarios, that's the beauty of a, of a digital twin is you can run many, many different what if scenarios before you actually even have the physical uh, because you're representing what that physical is 
and being able to do that. And this example is showing some thermal profiles going on with that, but it's very essential. And here is just a factoid. The world will spend close to 60 trillion in infrastructure to keep up with the growth. Major incentive in the construction industry, in those areas in the building to identify solutions to, again, that transform that productivity and delivery through new technologies and improved practices. And one of the areas, in fact, this is one of the uh, the founders of the Digital Twin is is in this construction area, and that's exactly what they're looking to do. The um, the chair of the uh, the Digital Twin um, steering committee was the CEO of GE Digital. Now he is the CEO of Digital Transformation for this uh, massive property uh, management and uh, construction company Lendlease. His name is Bill Rue. So now we get into areas here where we're looking at not just looking out at, at specific variables or assets, we're looking at entire smart cities. We're looking to understand how can we bring those efficiencies together and being able to have a complete environment, a complete digital twin of the actual city. And it extends even further than that. And I'll show some examples coming up to even looking at a digital twin of the entire country. And you can imagine the amount of processing, the high performance compute that's required to be able to support that. By 2020, 30% will have already implemented digital twins. The growth is tremendous. We can look at it from a healthcare standpoint and virtualizing what's happening to be able to provide just uh, unknown levels of healthcare uh, than what was able to be provided in the past. Even in supply chain management, being able to ensure that, and if you think about it, I was talking with one of uh, one of the members. They're dealing with a, a company that handles uh, all the uh, oxygen, all the um, the gas that would be required for all the different hospitals for life support in these areas. And you can imagine uh, the amount of data that has to be processed and understood in what if scenarios, because if they can't make their supply chain then the hospitals go without and, and lives are, uh, are jeopardized. So some other applications, we already saw a little bit of aerospace and defense, uh, automotive, I'll give a couple examples coming up in those areas. Uh, all of these, basically these cyber physical systems and energy and heavy machinery, pharmaceuticals, all being very, very um, uh, reliant and being able to understand both from the compute standpoint and the digital twin and virtualization. This is just uh, this was just a year ago, and you can see here, 10% already have used, but 60% of these organizations will plan to be using digital twins within one year, and almost 70% have a plan to go into production. So the importance and the significance really, uh, you have companies before that were saying, you know. Digital transformation, that's nice. We're doing okay. Everything's fine. We don't see any reason we should be hurrying or doing anything. So we have some plans and they're going to be a couple years down the road. Okay. We're operating very fine. But now here comes the pandemic. Digital transformation is immediate. You have to have that. If you can't get access to your assets, if you can't get access to your um, facilities, what do you do? You have to have this digital transformation to allow you to do this. And just to really emphasize this, here you can see where that sort of curve was in terms of the market forecast for digital transformation, digital twins, which are enabling that transformation. And now look at what has happened now since COVID. And look at how this has taken off in this area. Almost 60% in terms of growth to go from 3.2 billion to almost 50 billion within a matter of four to five, uh, five to six years incredible amounts of growth because recognizing the value and the advantages that it provides, having the ability to have this massive level of compute available to handle all the different data at whether it's near real time speeds or being able to understand and take that virtualization to now have that almost identical representation of your physical asset. And really, if we look at a very simplified view, right? A digital twin has three main components the physical entities in the real world, their virtual models, and the connected data, the view that is providing to that, um, those, uh, both those multiple worlds. And it's all about the compute and being able to support the massive amount of data and doing that. High performance compute, as you'll see in this next example, is very key. But every single Tesla vehicle has a digital twin. 
Now, people may not understand the significance of that, but every single Tesla vehicle has a digital twin. And it is something about being able to show all the data at all the time, instant identity, always connected for immediate situational awareness. And that is what really is being able to drive a lot of the improvements and continuous improvements. Uh, there were examples where a self-driving uh, system was being used and as it would come out of the tunnel, the uh, difference in the light would cause changes in the performance of the vehicle, whether it would all of a sudden break or slow down uh, unexpectedly, um, react very differently from what um, would be expected. Well, because of this instant identity always connected, again, the situation identified, they could analyze that situation across the entire spectrum of vehicles that they had and then be able to run through different what-if scenarios, change the algorithm that was affecting that, and then be able over the air, again, because of just the massive compute involved, to be able to understand what the algorithm would do in all different types of scenarios, and then over the air automatically update every vehicle so that was no longer an issue. That is the power of the digital twin and being able to take that situational awareness and react uh, in many cases as needed uh, if, um, as, as quickly as possible. And so no surprise, this is a, a survey that had come out just looking at essentially in the US, looking at the digital twin market size, look at the highest growth, the largest growth, and that is gonna be in automotive but you can see across the board growth in all these areas. And that's really what's been uh, driving that. We'll, we'll, go from, uh, we'll go from the top of the road, top down into the mines. So here's another application. Uh, this is uh, one of the members of the Digital Twin Consortium was uh, um, grateful enough to, uh, to share this. This is one of the bores that they have within these systems. And when they first started, if you look a little bit, this is the path, everything in green, this long line here, that's the path of the main conveyor. This is 50 miles deep underground, 50 miles. And it's a conveyor belt essentially. And it has gearboxes and it has all the other mechanics and everything else you can imagine to be able to keep that operating. 50 miles at the end of this, there is a bore that actually bores through and there's uh, some uh, cyber physical systems, semi-autonomous that are able to dump the ore onto the conveyor belt and it starts its journey of 50 miles back out through the mine. Well, what happens when you start to have failures? If they identify and all of a sudden the conveyor belt goes down. In fact, in this case, this is uh, for a specific uh, uh, mineral that they're getting out that's used immediately. When this stops, they start losing revenue instant. So the challenge was, why are we starting to see all these different types of failures? And these dots indicate areas where they had failures. They had sensors, they had all this information, but they were handling it through spreadsheets, believe it or not. So along comes XM Pro and says, oh, well, we can actually take all that data, we can do massive levels of compute simultaneously in real time, do all these different what if scenarios and understand exactly where your failures are. And that's exactly what they did. Now you can see no red critical, which were immediate and maybe identify these areas, but they have enough time to go in. By the way, since it's 50 miles deep to get a crew down there, it takes over two hours. Typically half a day is gone just to get the crew down then they have to diagnose what's happening and then they come back out. Well, that's no longer the case. And in fact, what they've been able to do is be able to understand where the areas were and they've now moved this out of not just the conveyor belt, but into every one of their lines of equipment. Now, again, when these go down, they basically, over the period of time that they had, it's tens of millions of dollars that is being lost. They are now extending this across every single mine that they have. This is a major uh, company that has many mines, and they're already seeing the benefits of doing that. Again, what enabled that was the virtualization, was being able to access that data remotely and being able to have the level of compute necessary to understand all the different um, uh, permutations, all the different uh, data streams that were coming at them to analyze what the problems were. 
Okay, so let's get out of the mine and let's take a look at a, a digital twin. I told you we were looking at a digital twin you saw earlier of a city. What about a digital twin of a country? <laughs> that's, that's what's going on now. In the uh, Center for Digitally Built Britain, uh, this is a diagram borrowed from them where you can see they're actually looking at all dimensions of the activities within a country at the city level, at the township level, uh, looking at the traffic management, looking at all the different uh, energy management, water, waste, everything. So what they're doing is they're basically creating this ecosystem of connected twins. And you can imagine how much processing is necessary to be able to handle that. But you can see all the different areas, whether it's the local area, where it goes out in terms of the transportation. Now you're looking at the highway, bringing together all of these combined into these areas here, talking about the water treatment and utilities, all the rest of these things. And being able to uh, have this virtualized representation of the entire country. Another example I'll go into, and I have a short video if it's gonna cooperate, is this concept of, uh, of energy in a smart grid scenario. So looking at it from the standpoint of a smart grid, this is a company, this is a member that joined recently, they're called the Agile Fractal Grid. Now, everybody knows that with uh, a centralized system, if there's a failure in that centralized system, it's very hard to control all the, uh, uh, the areas that get affected by that. And we've had, especially here in the United States, we've seen with our, with our grid, with our US national grid, we've seen brownouts that affect entire cities or even blackouts. And that's again, because it's very centralized in nature. What this company is doing is looking at a way, and I will start the video, to use the same elements, the repeating patterns in nature, that being a fractal, to be able to take that approach in terms of the grid uh, strategy. And what that would be is nanogrids and microgrids that would be interconnected to be able to provide this. So this is a location in New Mexico. This is actually already uh, in progress and implemented. There was an energy transition act to reduce the amount of carbon and eventually become carbon free. And you can see the different areas and the expanses we're talking about now. I'll speed the video up. So excellent area for alternative energy, whether it's wind, whether it's solar, and being able to power the entire area through these different capabilities. And the concept here, and this is the town in uh, in New Mexico, in the state of New Mexico, where they have this uh, playing out this concept of this fractal grid. So this is one area. They have high speed underground uh, connections. Here's the data center with very high performance compute, being able to analyze all the situations of what's going on within the, um, within the scenario. So now we have a huge bank of a solar array to capture that. We have the wind to be able to capture that. And now we go in, this was a coal plant, coal-fired plant, and that's how they were getting their, their power. This has now been decommissioned. So now that's from a, a, a green uh, environment, very helpful for the environment. And now it's been decommissioned and it's moving forward with the approach to be able to bring new source using the alternative uh, resources of solar and wind in those areas and you will see here oops the example i'm going to speed it up a little bit so here's this concept of the fractal grid so you have basically those resources now being brought out in terms of certain areas or fractals that they can in the event there's a problem if there's a attack whether it's nature whether it's a cybersecurity or whether it's a physical attack, they can immediately isolate those areas and not affect the rest of the, uh, of the area as a result of that. So this whole concept of, of fractalization or fractal grids requires massive compute, as you could imagine. Very, very high speed switching. All of these capabilities. Now there are other byproducts that come from this. So you have a massive high performance compute. You have very, very high speed switching, high speed telecommunications linked in. You can see here the system through gigabit fiber, interconnect, 
but the other byproduct is now using the telecommunications. So these become not just a energy uh, generating source, but they also become a source of very high performance compute, very uh, high speed uh, connectivity, and that can translate from small towns using this fractal concept into smart cities. And from these smart cities, it can actually go into entire countries. And you can start to see how this could develop very rapidly. And a digital twin is at the heart of this to be able to virtualize and understand what is happening, what are the different scenarios that may come into play with the massive level of compute. Let's see, I think it's gonna to get to that section. Uh, involved. And yeah, so then it will come right through here. And as I said, the digital twin is, is key to this whole strategy because it's actually being brought out in this high performance compute center to be able to understand all the ramifications, everything, and it's monitoring every single one of these fractal nodes. So you can just imagine the amount of processing to be able to handle that. But this is the concept of being able to use distributed energy resources and then be able to have this uh, distributed source of all the different uh, um, compute and those different areas. So that, we will move this, we'll stop here and we will go on to the next, which actually gives you a sort of an overview of what we just talked about. You have the electric power generation coming from those alternative energy resources, wind, solar, hydro, you have the massive high performance compute required. You have the most advanced telecommunications and you have a very strong security enclave. All of these would represent one node. You connect all these nodes together, you now get a complex. You connect the complexes together, you get an entire region. And then you bring that even forward and you bring those all together and you have now a complete natural national situational awareness center, all managed through the virtualization of this grid, but the high performance compute is the key. Now, one other byproduct as a result of this is because you have this energy generation, you can actually then feed in uh, through the electrolyzer, water, separate, and now you have alternative fuel. So now you have green hydrogen. So it's pretty amazing what this type of a fractal grid approach is really bringing together and it's central in terms of being able to have the digital twin to be monitoring that having all the different what if scenarios and obviously that high performance compute you have very high re high resiliency to the faults high availability of the system so you don't take out an entire um, uh, city or or massive region you can control that and through again through the grid be able to have both the power generation as well as the alternative fuel capability and when I say alternative fuel, you're really looking at no carbon emission. You're looking at green hydrogen. And I don't know if uh, you've seen the headlines lately, but the investments into this are in the billions and it's across, uh, it's across the globe. It's incredible what's uh, been going on. And Digital Twin is enabling a lot of this. So that said, what are some of the challenges uh, that are being faced with implementing a Digital Twin? There's limited interoperability. There's a lot of market confusion. I'll give you just a very high level example. You ask anybody, say 10 different companies, what is a digital twin? You will get 12 different answers. It is that confusing in those areas. And obviously there's a lot of resources involved. It's a very, uh, it's a journey to start this whole digital twin effort as you can see. But some of these challenges, as I said, the limited interoperability, the market confusion, uh, once you start down a path, you really need to follow that through. And usually the software world doesn't play as well uh, in terms of interoperability to uh, the side on the digital twin side. But if you get this right, the payoff is extremely high, as I showed you in a couple of the examples. So how does a consortium help to solve those challenges? It can improve the interoperability, work together with the different uh, um, standards bodies, to drive uh, open source, uh, open standards, work to accelerate the market, bring examples forward, 
help to guide other companies in doing this and really demonstrate the value, the business outcomes. So that's where the Digital Twin Consortium comes in. We are working to drive the adoption, the use, the interoperability, and the development of digital twin technology, propelling the innovation of the digital twin technology through open source and consistent approaches. We've dedicated towards accelerating the market and ensuring and helping and guide the outcomes for our users. The family is really overall is the object management group, which has been uh, part of several, launched several successful consortiums. The recent, most recent was the Industrial Internet Consortium. Uh, and and um, being able to really demonstrate new capabilities and new innovations that were actually implemented through their testbed uh, abilities from the early stages of the pilot factory all the way into production and being able to be monetized. Um, the latest is the Digital Twin Consortium, and I'll tell you, when it was founded back in mid-May, there were four main founders. Now there are eight now, and then the groundbreakers, these are the key companies, there's between 20 to 30 at that point in time. Now there's over 150, and, and honestly, I see new members coming in on a weekly, if not sometimes a daily basis. It's just incredible. Here's the overall membership of the region. Um, led by uh, North America, but Europe also coming up very strong as well as a strong contingency. We talked about the importance in the smart cities and the other areas in terms of construction um, and seeing growth in both Australia, New Zealand, as well as Asia and even Latin America. So 22 companies. So this is a global consortium in all rights and it is member driven. And the first year priorities, what we're focusing on is to be able to help eliminate that market confusion or cut through that market confusion by giving real world use cases, case studies that show and demonstrate the value and how we've done and addressed, how our members have addressed those challenges uh, to succeed to recognize these values. Uh, we have an organization that is focused or a structure where we have working groups. A horizontal working group is looking across the high level of the terminology, the taxonomy, and the technology. When I say like a horizontal technology, things that would apply to all the different segments. Then we have vertical groups, and you'll see some of those coming up, where we're looking at the product life cycle, looking at the different areas in terms of uh, what are the challenges at the differentiated as we get into our vertical market, whether it's aerospace and defense, or whether it's a natural resources, as you saw with smart grid or oil and gas or mining. And then being able to have this digital twin conference, which has already been established for uh, mid, uh, mid to Q3 of next year. So really uh, anticipating being able to demonstrate, and showcase these. So as I said, the initial working groups, we have our cross-cutting group, which is the technology terminology, talking about security and trustworthiness. When I say trustworthiness, we're leveraging a lot of the work that the Industrial Net Consortium has done. Uh, if you're interested in the security side or the trustworthy side, I encourage you to download that document. It's a security framework and a security maturity model. The trustworthiness includes resiliency, reliability, all those things we talked about important to the grid. Uh, the security from the standpoint of privacy of data, from the standpoint of safety, all these different areas. That's what I call the horizontal technologies that cross cut every one of these areas. And you can imagine the amount of compute that's critical to that. The definition, being able to have a common tech taxonomy, a common understanding, a common language that can then provide this cohesiveness and alignment between the different uh, um, vertical areas are focused on. And then of course, all important is the technology stacks and bringing in the different elements of how we actually can uh, interoperate in those, whether it's open source or uh, what aspects uh, in terms of bringing in the external data and how does that align with these. So lots of uh, great work that's uh, underway. And then we get into the actual vertical working groups, which is the aerospace and defense, the infrastructure, and think about that covering from individual buildings all the way up to smart cities and traffic management, transportation, rail, uh, air, all those types of things that would be associated with the infrastructure. And then manufacturing is all industrial, but it's not just industrial, it's also looking at it across the board in terms of applications such as supply chain management. You saw how critical that can be. And natural resources is the mining, you saw the example there, but it's also oil and gas and uh, utility, smart grid, alternative resources, hydro, um, solar, wind, all the things I was showing you uh, in that area. 
and then being able to advocate that and, and highlight that and drive the adoption and the awareness through our, uh, our marketing uh, working group. But here you can see within that horizontal all the key elements necessary where we're talking about what are the common characteristics throughout the life cycle of that digital twin? What are the compute requirements? What are the necessary elements around that? What are the enabling technologies for each of those characteristics? And then, as I said, the platform stack and bringing those other aspects together. This is the infrastructure working group. It's uh, co-chaired or chaired by uh, Richard Ferris from Lendlease, as I was talking about, but we have representation of Microsoft uh, and other um, key, uh, key companies in this area, GAFCON, uh, very instrumental working directly with the owners. Uh, but you can see the goals here, reduce the cost, increase the efficiency, increase the uh, overall productivity and sustainability. Natural resources, we talked about that. Aerospace and defense is really interesting because you saw the one example for the uh, asset itself in that case being virtualized and the compute that would be required for that. But you also could think of it as in terms of being able to show the uh, the intrusion detection and the security. One of the things the working groups are, are bringing out is how gamification is being used in game theory to be able to uh, do these mock, uh, mock attacks and be able to use that and understand all the different scenarios and uh, permutations. And we have a US Air Force representation there as well as uh, Dell Technologies. In fact, I didn't mention, but Dell Technologies is the, uh, it leads the uh, overall horizontal uh, working group, that te technology, taxonomy, and terminology. Um, <clears throat> manufacturing here led by ANSYS and Dell as well. And really, why would you want to get involved? You've seen all the great things going on. You've seen all the excitement that's happening and the, across these different areas. Well, you really can help to influence and drive uh, the working groups and drive the direction that the industry is taking and how they're using uh, digital twins and how become your thought leadership, your innovation, uh, be able to demonstrate that. Um, collaboration and learning, being able to have access to, to these members and the, and the tremendous uh, knowledge base of experience, uh, just, just incredible, and opportunities to then go out and share your experience, your innovation, your uh, thought leadership and be able to drive that. So a lot of uh, great opportunities as a result. And really, if you wanna learn more about the consortium and the different areas, uh, there's a whole series of webinars that the, uh, the working group chairs have put together. We have a, a brief introduction and there's a overview that uh, video, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a short two minute, but it covers some of the points I've done here, as well as um, where we're heading with that and being able to go out even further into these uh, the virtual conferences uh, coming up here in, in December. So that was my presentation. I want to thank you very much for taking time out to uh, hear and learn about digital twins, the compute required, and the uh, opportunities with the Digital Twin Consortium. OK. Uh... Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for your presentation. Really interesting. Uh, here we have one question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sabri, Sabri Plana uh, is asking if are you are you cooperating with uh, Transcontinuum Initiative of ETP for HPC? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the the first acronym. Transcontinuum Initiative of ATP, ETP for HPC. If, if Digital Twin Consortium is, is cooperating with, with this initiative. For HPC. You know, I, I will have to confirm that, but I would not be surprised if one of our members is not involved with that. Uh, I know I went a little bit over here. I don't know if uh, Saeed Tibet, he is from the CTO office. He's a distinguished engineer from uh, Dell Technologies. He was going to give a little bit uh, an overview of HPC and, and what's been going on in those uh, with some specific examples. Has he joined? I, I, I'm on the call, yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. Perfect timing. So maybe yeah, you okay. can trans continue. I, I can, yeah, I can answer that question quickly. Um, I figured you would. All right. Yeah, we, uh, so thank, thank you, you again, everybody. Saeed, do you want to introduce Saeed, please? Um, sure. I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, fantastic. All right. Uh, good. Good afternoon and good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, so 
My name is Saeed Tibet. I uh, am um, the chief architect for Dell Technologies uh, Global CTO. Um, and um, on the external side, I'm involved in a number of initiatives um, as a steering committee member for DTC. Um, and also, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, when I joined, uh, I'm chairing the um, uh, the 3T uh, working group, uh, the horizontal working group. Um, I'm also involved in other efforts, uh, the object management group on the board, as well as uh, uh, in uh, silicon photonics uh, activities, as well as industrial IoT um, and autonomous uh, um, vehicles, um, like the Autonomous Edge Computing Consortium. Uh, with regards to that question, again, thanks for asking that. There's definitely um, a number of um, activities by the membership. As you probably see, if you look at the membership on the DTC, we have uh, uh, ANSYS, we have others. Uh, from our perspective at Dell as well, uh, we have a group that's focused on HPC. Uh, we provide the infrastructure on HPC. And uh, with regards to those initiatives specifically, uh, the Digital Twin Consortium is looking for um, um, ways to collaborate through a program on our side, um, um, uh, more as a liaison, as we call it. So that will be the, the process that we're going to be following. And we're just getting that started. Yeah. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Saeed. Did you have some slides you wanted to show? Um, no slides at the moment, but I do want to speak about a couple things, which is really interesting, particularly from a, an HPC point of view. Uh, there have been some examples where we uh, participated, um, uh, particularly in the automotive, in, in the high-end automotive business, uh, like in Formula One and other uh, related high-performance um, uh, environments, where there is a need for uh, a design that has literally 0% carryover in the sense that uh, uh, you'd need like new CAD models of the vehicles to be generated uh, every few minutes or so, uh, particularly during race time, et cetera. Um, and this kind of a, an effort also that uh, supports the, uh, the use of HPC from that perspective uh, to enable simulation-based certification. As you probably know in manufacturing and automotive, many of these safety-driven environments, uh, the typical time frame could be, uh, I would say, uh, maybe a year and a half, two years minimum, uh, could be more. But in this case, uh, you need to do this in a matter of days, and that's where this plays an important role. Um, in many discussions with, with customers, as I was telling Dan, uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is the fact that um, uh, particularly with the very large ones in the uh, think uh, the world of um, uh, very complex manufacturing like uh, uh, for for planes and um, and uh, very high-end uh, manufacturing uh, devices etc you're looking at uh, first of all very large amounts of uh, data we're talking here zettabytes which even at the moment we're not even there yet. Um, uh, and think about it uh, in terms of millions of models, right? Uh, that require compute in the tens of millions of processors, uh, literally in, with those customers. There are very few of them that can actually do that when you think about it, even today, uh, maybe someone in the audience would correct me. Uh, I'm happy to do that. But I'll, I'll give you some of these examples. Um, uh, when you think about it uh, in terms of this order of magnitude, um, we're talking a level of computing that maybe think about uh, the Amazons, Facebook and Apple, Twitter, this kind of uh, Netflix, this kind of level thing. Um, it has impact on data center design, on the compute design and the level of acquisition of the uh, infrastructure compute and storage and networking assets um, and how they're implemented, right? Um, uh, you'll think about an environment today on average with the very large companies, hundreds of thousands of processors at most. Um, and um, uh, the scale of that is very important. Uh, and this is kind of where uh, you look at the simulation, particularly where, um, um, you know, commonly um, uh, things where a, a simulation uh, started by one simulation engineer uh, would take advantage of uh, some other work that was done by another engineer. So um, 
and, and there are some numbers there I can give you um, from those specific architecture uh, requirements, right? And, and that's really important. I mean, we think about accelerators, GPUs, FPGAs, and TPUs, et cetera, but this is, there is a lot more to it uh, than, than just this. Uh, it brings up really uh, um, some of these issues in terms of the life cycle of these environments as we look at it, particularly from a digital twin point of view and uh, some of the advantages uh, it brings up as we architect these new systems um, uh, from that perspective. And, and that's kind of one of the things I wanted to, to bring in. The other thing I think that's really important uh, is to think in terms of how do we reconfigure HPC um, uh, use cases to enable these capabilities or these levels of requirements at scale. For example, uh, metadata um, uh, as a result of these experiments becomes really important. Uh, an engineer, like I said, that would um, um, uh, logs, um, you know, requests, uh, maybe 10,000 cores to do a job uh, in something like ANSYS or any of your uh, favorite systems um, and gets recorded, the additional metadata is important. But as you, when you're looking at it, even today, it's very hard to search it, right? Uh, we need to know that a previous engineer did a similar job with that level of complexity or that level of resource requirements. Um, and that would help from that perspective, right? So there's a lot of things here when we look at it from a digital twin perspective that brings up this awareness of these requirements that are uh, very difficult to deal with um, uh, by driving this kind of unified orchestration tooling, et cetera. So I wanted to bring some of these examples uh, in, in manufacturing, in healthcare, it's similar. And the example I, I brought up in uh, automotive is also another one. I think that's kind of what I had then I wanted to, to speak to. And I apologize, I didn't put slides together, but um, um, uh, hopefully this kind of resonates with the audience here, which is important. Yeah. Oh, that was great. Thank, thank you, Saeed, that was perfect. So um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, again, thank you uh, all for uh, taking time to hear about the Digital Twin Consortium and the importance of that and the role of uh, HPC in there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Said. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Javier. Uh, okay, I will, I will introduce our next speaker. Uh, he's uh, uh, Carlos Esteban Puerto. Uh, he received his bachelor degree in mathematics from La Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia in 2016. Uh, and he has a master degree in artificial intelligence from La Universidad Politécnica de Madrid uh, here in Spain in 2018. He is currently a doctoral student at the, uh, at the same university uh, and is a research and developer in Angura IoT here in, in, in our headquarters in San Sebastián in Spain. So I will let uh, Esteban to, to share his, uh, his screen and go ahead with your, with your presentation. Okay, uh, can you see the slides? Can you hear me? Yes, everything perfect. Okay, uh, well, uh, I will talk about my work here at Angura IIoT, which is developed artificial intelligence algorithms for building surveillance. Uh, this is the agenda of what I'm going to talk. I will give a brief introduction of the motivation of this speak uh, and why this problem is important for companies and industries also a workflow of what I'm doing currently. Then I will talk about uh, processing data, artificial intelligence models that we are using here at Angura, uh, some results from an online available uh, data set of bearings, some conclusions and a future work. Well, let's begin. Uh, as I said, I work with bearings. Bearings are, a compo are uh, mechanical components that are inside many industrial uh, machining tools. Uh, machining tool machines, um, they are pretty important because they are the frequently reason why of, down, of downtimes inside production lines. Um, when you go to those uh, industries, they usually have uh, some expert that is telling them when they have to change the bearings or they have a schedule that is telling them when they have to change the bearing. 
Uh, the problem with these strategies is that in the first case, uh, the expert may not be a total expert or might have some problems. We don't know, but may happen that the bearing fails or they go and check the bearing and it's, it's still good. So the bearing is not uh, used as it should be. And what we want to do is to take the most of the bearing and use it until it fails. Uh, also prepare and have the time to prepare when to do a change when it is necessary. So here I show a workflow of what I'm working with. We begins with the mirror sensor measure from sensors, accelerometers, thermocouples, etc. From them, we do a signal processing procedure. And with that signal processing procedure, we generate some features that are used to train an artificial intelligence model. And with that artificial intelligence model, we evaluate, evaluate new data. And with this new data, we determine the bearing health. Uh, what I most uh, emphasize is that we want to work with data flows. We don't want to work offline. So every time we're receiving data and we are all the time evaluating our model and watching its fitness. So here uh, I will discuss this uh, later, but there will be like a kind of reevaluation process or a training process for the, our models. So when new trends begin to appear in the data, we'll be, we will be able to understand and um, fit our models to the new trends that are appearing. Well, uh, let's begin with the processing data part. Uh, to work with artificial intelligence, in these cases, we need first the data and we take them from sensors that are coupled or put on machines or on industry, uh, well, machines. Uh, for example, here we have a mechanical setup from the Femto. Uh, here we see th that they are using accelerometers for sensors, thermocouples, etc. But we're mostly interested in accelerometers. Why, why accelerometers? Uh, we use accelerometers because we, from the measures that they take, we can uh, watch and observe some frequencies that are fundamental that are um, that are own of the bearing i mean there are some frequencies that describe the bearing that are associated with each part of the bearing and those frequencies are related to the geometry of the of the bearing so what we need to do now is to uh, extract the data use some kind of uh, data processing and extract some features that represent the bearing, and those are in the frequency space. So for the processing data, we have a lot of techniques. And you, if you see the literature, the literatures, uh, you will see a lot of techniques like short time Fourier transform, wavelet transform, uh, excuse me, uh, hilbert Huang uh, transformation, EMD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here uh, we show two examples of two possible data processing that you can use. For example, here at the left, you can see a fast curtogram that is used to filter the signal and find a transients on data that those transients are usually related to failures or the appearance or, or the, the uh, generation of failures in the bearing. Or you can use a short time transfer, a short, a short time Fourier, Fourier transform that is shown at the right that it shows how the uh, frequencies are evolving in time. In particular, in our case, we in here in Angura, we are focused in use court, uh, court, uh, courtograms and other techniques like Hilbert transform. And well, that's what we do. Uh, with respect to the artificial intelligence models, uh, since we are working with bearings and we want to see them, uh, how they evolve in time, we, we know that they follow a non-stationary non process. When we talk about non-stationary processes, we are talking about data which its flow, uh, which its trends are uh, changing in time. I mean, when the bearing is healthy, the measures of acceleration that we are seeing are not the same uh, like the observations of acceleration that we see when the bearing begins to fail. So. A hidden Markov model is a good way to learn and to capture those non-stationary data. 
So here we can see an example uh, of a hidden Markov model. A hidden Markov model can be seen as a double stochastic process when where one, uh, one of the process is observable, which is the Y process here, and one which is non-observable, which is the X process. And usually the X process uh, is a Markov, a Markov chain. So with this model, we are trying to understand the, the non-stationary data. Nevertheless, we know that as we're train, working with data flows, we know that when, once a trend is learned, maybe when new data begins to arrive, the, uh, the, mo the learned model will, will not be good enough to explain the new data. So we will need to do a relearning process, but I will speak about it later. Uh, here at Angura, we are trying to develop new, new strategies or new models for, for hidden Markov models. Uh, in my case, I, I've been working with asymmetric hidden Markov models, which uh, are used to explain data uh, depending on the context. Um, when I say depending on the context, it is depending on the hidden state or, or the value of the non-stationary process, like we can see it this way. And depending on the state of the hidden states, the, the re probabilistic relationship between variables will change. And this is kind of plausible because when you think of a veering with, when it's not failing, uh, the relationship between frequential components will not be the same when the bearing is beginning to fail. And the frequencies will be more related and there will be more evidence of those relationships when the bearing is, begin is, is failing. So this is the model that we are developing and working with here at Angura. Uh, here uh, we can see an example of, uh, of what I was speaking up uh, before, that is when do we need to change the model? Uh, to do this, we uh, base our mo uh, we evaluate our models with what we call the big score, that it's a measure of fitness of the model. Um, when this big score begins to grow, it means that the new data that we are receiving is not longer valid for the model. So what we always are trying to look is what we call the page test. And um, when this page test uh, gives the the green light, we make what we call a concept drift. The concept drift here is uh, seen as a vertical uh, black line. Whenever there is a vertical black line, uh, our model is retrained. And as we can see, when there is a retraining of the model, the big score goes, go, goes down again. This means that our model is good at, it has again a good fit but this has to be done um, in time. Whenever new data begins to arrive, we have to see if the model is good to explain it. And if the page test says that is no longer valid our model, we have to retrain it. Uh, well, I will give some results from a database that is online. It, it comes from the Femto repository. Uh, here, uh, we have bearings that are put in extreme blood conditions so they can fail very quickly. And the experiments uh, were stopped when 20G were observed in the data. Um, we are assuming for this time that we don't have any kind of no previous training or data. What we, when we say we don't have any previous training data is that we don't have any run to failure data. When you see the literature, many authors assume this kind of, of data that is existent. And they usually try to learn from the run to failure data to model the, to model uh, and to learn a model. But we are only trying to understand the data from, from zero when we're like going blind. Also, we compute a health index estimation based on the models so on the parameter models to determine how good or how bad our uh, bearing is. Uh, before talking, uh, going further, I want to talk with some of the works with, we have been doing with the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Uh, they have been helping us in, in the data processing phase since we're working with a data flow. We need to do this kind of data processing very, very fast and very quickly. So we don't lose any information or the buffers don't lose any kind of data. So 
uh, with the help of then since our first version, uh, at our first version of the code or our data processing, we were uh, running that, that phase in, at 2.6 seconds. But with the use of parallel, parallelizations and the use of public libraries like, like FFTW, which is very helpful to determine the best way to perform a fast Fourier transform, we were able to do this data processing task uh, very fast at a speed of 0.2 seconds. So we uh, fasten up the process uh, 10, 10 times. It's 10 times faster, which is pretty good for us. Well, uh, this is what we obtained from the data. We, after the, our data processing, we obtained this, as I said before, some fre fundamental frequencies from the bearing, which, is, which are the BPFI, which refers to the bearing inner ring or the frequency that is telling us that the inner ring is failing, the BPFFO, which is telling us that the outer ring is failing, the BSF, which is telling us that the rollers of the bearing is, are beginning to fail, the FTF, which is telling us that the bearing, bearing cage is, be is beginning to fail. As we can see, as time goes, those frequencies begin to grow in time, which is an, indi an indication that uh, clearly that the bearing is beginning to fail. So this is what our uh, artificial intelligence model is doing. We observe that for the, for the, four, uh, for the four first time hours, the first learned model was enough to explain this this time. Nevertheless, at the four, four hours, after the four first hours, there was a incremental in the peak and our training process is observed. At, at the same time, we observed that the health index that is being processed by the model is beginning to go down. Here, the health index, uh, the more lower or the more goes to, to minus infinity, it means that the bearing is in a worse state. So as we can see, uh, since the first concept drift is, it appears, there, there comes more and more concept drifts and also the health state of the bearing is beginning to go down. But where, what is important is to see that in spite that we are learning a first hidden Markov model from the first data, this model was enough to explain four four hours of, of the building's life. So we expect to use this kind of information to generate some, to generate some insights to the client or to some industry of when they have to do an exchange in their, in their bearings. Well, uh, future work. First of all, we would like to do the same process of data processing, but with the learning uh, of hidden Markov models, we want to boost the speed of learning. So this can be done in real time. Uh, we also desire to compute, uh, remaining, to compute the remaining useful life of the bearings from this health index. And not only show the bearings health, but also tell the producer or the or the industry when their bearings are going to fail. So they can know when they have to do an exchange of the bearing. Additionally, uh, we want to make a subsexhalation technique techniques to determine which uh, frequencies, uh, harmonic frequencies can be also used for the study. We have evidence that also not only the fundamental frequencies, but also the harmonics can be useful to understand the bearing's health. So we would like to generate a strategy or a future subsexhalation technique such that can help us to determine which, frequent, which fre uh, harmonics can be used. And finally, in case of de developing such methodology, we would like to boost the speed of this method of the future subsexhalation methodology. Well, uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's all. Okay, uh, thank you, Esteban. Uh, I have, uh, well, uh, three questions uh, for you. So the first one is coming from Xavier Marquegui. Uh, it says, 
Uh, you, you were talking about certain uh, retraining events that act as a corrective measures for correcting uh, the representative value of the analyze system. Uh, it's meaning the, the peak value. What, what triggers those retraining events? Is it a manual step done by the user or does the system automatically determine when that uh, needs to happen? And uh, no, as I said before, uh, we're using the page Hinkley test to determine when this has to be done. So the, the system itself, it knows when it has to re be retrained. Okay. Uh, that's, I hope that uh, answers the question. Okay. Well, uh, uh, the next question is, what is missing in the algorithm so it can be used in an online environment? If, first of all, it's, it is, is, is still low. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a still a slow, the, uh, the algorithm. Um, we still need to implement it, it in our hardware. Okay, that question has been done, has been uh, placed by Marcela Rondon, and I will just update a little bit more on that on that question uh, from my side. Uh, how do you see this system working in real industrial environments? Um, well, there's uh, some some. Well, we are uh, we are still developing this, so we'll still need to know which are the frequency of the data we have to receive, so the algorithm doesn't collapse. Um, we also need to know uh, some thresh thresholds that need to be fit uh, adjusted for an online setup. There are still many things that we have to fit and adjust, but I think it could be used on in an online environment. Okay. I think all the questions are answered. I don't know well, if there is not more questions. Uh, Filippo, I think we can go to the, to the next yes. to the speaker. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add one comment about the last question that is uh, collaborating with Angura. We are looking at the first implementation of what um, Esteban um, presented and uh, and yeah, there is a, th th there are basically two directions in order to go online with this kind of uh, algorithm. So one is the uh, analysis or the optimization of the algorithm itself that is more like what Esteban, Esteban was presenting. And the second step is a, a, a step of optimization uh, of the computing part that we are doing here at ESC. We, we have some, uh, some uh, uh, say, uh, test that we've done that we we can gain uh, order an order of magnitude in, in terms of uh, of uh, uh, speed in um, of this uh, analysis that was presented by Stephen. But 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 uh, this is this is something that is uh, still ongoing. So we expect to be able to to speed up a little bit this this uh, um, this model that, that presented by, by has been presented by Steve. This was just a, a minor thing that um, I wanted to point out. Um, okay, so we have our last speaker, unless there are other questions or, uh, no, I don't see anything in the question Q&A session. So our last speaker is Jama Bosch, is a researcher at the Barcelona Computing Center and also professor at the uh, U University Polytechnic of Catalonia. And uh, I think Jama, if you want to share your screen, let's see if we can see. Okay. Jama is part, is researcher at the programming model group here at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Yeah, and we're going to see his screen now. Ready? Your okay. Screen. The so screen. the floor is yours. Yes, everything is fine. Okay, so we listen uh, to you, Jama. Thank you. Okay. I'm Jamo Bosk and I'm a PhD student in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, I'm working in the ONSAT FPGA team. Uh, and in this team, what we are trying to do is facilitate the usage of FPGA uh, devices uh, at the programming model level. And these are useful for the application programmers since they can easily de develop their um, applications 
in these platforms that are able to provide a high performance with a reduced power consumption. And what I'm going to present is um, our last work that it's towards uh, recurrent tasks in these systems. But uh, starting from the beginning, uh, norms that FPGA task is basically what we are uh, showing here. I, uh, this is a C example where we have uh, two functions that are annotated with compiler directives, OMS uh, compiler directives. And the two tasks have the target device FPGA uh, annotation that uh, instruct the compiler that we want to place or we want to execute the, the code, the body of this task inside the, the FPGA. And the rest of the syntax, uh, the, the input and in out, in, in out dependencies are handled as regular in this uh, task-based programming models that on this uh, like OpenMP in this sense. So for instance, in this case, uh, the main calls the task zero and task one so as they have uh, an input output dependence uh, among a variable, they will be uh, executed in order by the runtime. And this is also happening in our framework. What we are trying to add um, is this support for FPGA devices in this uh, level of programming uh, models. So uh, in this example that I show you what uh, our Toolchain does is gets this uh, source code and the compilation ends up with uh, two files instead of one. Uh, the one, one is the regular binary that is executed in the processor. And the other is the, the bit stream that mm, can be uploaded in the FPGA, which is represented, represented by the, the blue part with the two rockets that represent the two tasks that we have uh, in the example and it's attached to the host, which is in the orange. So the, the execution is uh, done as usual. We just go to the host and maybe we need to upload the, the bitstream and configure the FPGA at the beginning, if not already done. And after that, we can execute the, the binary as, as a sequential and regular uh, program. This is uh, how does it work. And our vision is try to uh, make the, the FPGA's systems more autonomous and have this kind of uh, distributed view where the FPGA's can do things by their self and are not all the time managed by the, by the host. In, in fact, what we are trying to do is uh, put most of the parts of the management inside the FPGA because it can do the things very fast and with a smaller power footprint and keep the host uh, free for uh, actions that are not, uh, that are sporadic, I don't know. So um, our first improvement in these systems is try to support what we uh, call recurrent tasks in the, in the programming model side. A recurrent task is just uh, the same as a, a task as before, but we add two new uh, properties, which are the, the period and the number of times that we want to execute this task. So the, the task, when the starts, it's uh, executed uh, several times and every period at least. So each task can have their own period and the runtime by itself starts executing this task among the time. And each time can has their own duration without, without involving anything more. So uh, the programming model, we to reflect this kind of systems, what we did is add two new clauses in the compiler directives to allow the programmers to specify the period of the task and the number of repetitions that we want to execute of this task. They are not mandatory, so just having one of these makes the task a recurrent task. For instance, if we are in a real-time system where we want to execute forever the task, we just can put the period and don't put any number of repetitions, so the task will be executed forever. Uh, every period. 
and also we added some uh, auxiliary functions or I'm say runtime functions, let's say, uh, like the OpenMP get num threads and this in this kind of sense. So the new functions allows the programmers to get the repetition number of the task and maybe if some uh, condition is is meet, uh, it's possible also to cancel the pending repetitions with the anonymous cancel recurrent task. So uh, the the following repetitions are canceled and the task ends uh, immediately. And also know that a recurrent task uh, may call another regular task, synchronize them. So the, the code support in, a, in the body of this kind of task is the same uh, as a regular task. So there is no restriction in this sense. And following with that, our next, uh, the second proposal that we, we added is adding support for critical regions, which are um, regions that only can be executed in one of the, the actors. So we added support for that uh, clause inside the FPGA devices also. So in the, in a, in the previous example, for example, or in, in this example, we will have uh, four instances of this function full, and they will be synchronized uh, by inside the FPGA. So each one can uh, update the IDX variable atomically and get the local index value correctly done. And after that, they uh, do whatever they need to do with that index. This is, this is more of functional feature because it's very related with the, the recurrent tasks as we have we, we may have several tasks that run independently and the start every period, uh, having some mechanism to coordinate them and allow mutual exclusion accesses to some variables is very useful to, to have to implement the applications correctly. And as an example for to, to this approach, uh, this is a data flow example of uh, an application that could be programmed with this system. The light blue boxes represent the, the recurrent tasks and the, the, green, uh, the green boxes represent memory regions and the other uh, bo blue boxes and the round boxes are regular tasks, non-periodic ones. So here what we have is uh, several N recurrent tasks that at each period uh, read the a sensor, the value of a sensor and write the data inside uh, some buffers. And the write of, of the data into this buffer is uh, synchronized by um, a critical region as the reader also needs to empty these buffers every period. So in the, the reader side, we have the handling that it's creating several uh, inner tasks. One that merges all the data available read since, the, since that moment by the, from the sensors and merge it into a, a new chunk of memory that it's uh, processes, processed by uh, anything of the approaches that our previous talk uh, target for. And after that, we can place uh, other functions that check if there is some error uh, on this data or even write the data to a uh, disk in order to have a trace of the execution. So the important thing here is that the FPGA is able to reverse of log tasks to, uh, to the host autonomously. So, we can keep the, as I said before, the host free and just uh, wake up them whenever there is something to do there. And also there is support to conditionally uh, wake up the, the tasks in the host. For, for instance, if the FPGA uh, checks the, the, the data to search for errors, they may trigger a task in the host in order to uh, send a message or do anything that's needed. And this is the versatility that we want to, to add to these systems. And as an as a initial result, uh, we measured with uh, 
synthetic approach to see the, the limits of our proposal of having this recurrent task managed in the FPGA. So we tested uh, this benchmark in a Z board, which has two ARM cores and the FPGA runs at uh, 100 megahertz. So here, what we mes measure is the effectiveness of the execution. <laughs> And um, the effectiveness is defined as uh, the real execution time of the benchmark against the optimal execution time. So we can compare, uh, in blue, we have the, the implementation using our approach. And in orange, we have the, an, an equivalent implementation without using our features. So it's uh, having it's having the same functionality, but uh, implementing from the host the management of all these uh, recurrent tasks. And what we see is uh, the effectiveness among the, oops, sorry, the effectiveness among the different periods. I mean, the, the, the recurrent tasks, uh, the, this is the period of the recurrent tasks. And the different lines represent the, the duration of these recurrent tasks. So what we can see here is that uh, with our approach, with managing these recurrent tasks directly inside the FPGA, the effectiveness is always near to the, to the best case, which is uh, into the top. And in contrast, in the baseline approach, which manages these recurrent tasks from the host, and includes uh, some extra effort, uh, has a uh, performance degradation. So we, we, we need to have a task duration uh, seven, 17 microseconds uh, smaller than, than, the, than the period in order to allow the synchronization of the host with the FPGA to be uh, accomplished. Otherwise, the, the overheads of managing and the sending the data from, from the host to the FPGA kills the, the effectiveness of the application and makes the, no sense for the system to be used. And this uh, chart is at microsecond scale. So in order to better see the, the limitations of the FPGA management, we repeated the experiments, but uh, using nanoseconds scale uh, tasks. So here we also have the effectiveness among um, different periods for a shorter task durations. And the host management, it's only show us as a reference here because uh, it's the performance is all near to zero. That means that uh, it's not an option to manage this uh, kind of tasks from the host because the, the overheads are killing the, the effectiveness. So we need uh, to manage the FPGA stuff directly from the FPGA. And here we also see these uh, small down parts that we see before, but they are more uh, smaller and thinner than compared to before. It's around 60 and 60 nanoseconds that's uh, 1000 times smaller than before so in in this case the, the fpga is able to manage tasks that are uh, very closer to the the period the duration of the task is very closer to the period and more or less that's that's all as a as a, as a conclusion uh, what we propose here is uh, increasing the the FPGA systems programmability with the, these recurrent tasks and the, the support of the critical that's related. And the first uh, results show that the directly managing this FPGA recurrent task inside the, the FPGA and doing it autonomously, it's uh, 1000 times faster than compared than classical approach. And also the benefits are the, the low latency and low power that the FPGA management has. And also this uh, management has a very small footprint in the FPGA resources. It's less than 1%. Uh, 
And uh, another benefit is that with this uh, new approach, we are freeing the, the general purpose CPU because it does not need to uh, do the management of the task, the recurrent task, and it's able to do other useful things. So in fact, we are increasing the, the computational capacity of the overall system. And with this approach, what we do is uh, keep the control of the things uh, near to the, to the action where, where it's happening and where the data is being uh, processed. So thank you, this is more or less, and if there is any question or things that are not clear. Thank you, thank you, Jama. Perfect timing, actually. So uh, if there are questions from the audience, I don't see questions posted in the Q&A session. Otherwise, I just have a minor. In the meantime, I just ask a curiosity. You mentioned that uh, what you presented in, uh, implies 1% uh, of uh, usage of resources in the FPGA, right? So, so which is... Uh, which is the impact of, of so one percent in the Z board that you tried or yeah or? it's it's uh, for the example but in fact okay yeah it's it's measured in the example but it's expected to be uh, proportionally similar to any any other board so it's okay uh, so it's, it's really the, really uh, almost yeah, it's irrelevant, the so. extra resources needed to to doing the management and keep the host um, free. It's this just 1% uh, of the resources. And uh, also the power consumption was increased by one milliwatt. So, but okay. Okay. it's very small because we were talking about uh, a system that it's consuming around a few watts. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we have to close, uh, we have to close now, so. Um, I want to thank all the speakers that contributed to this session, uh, my colleague Javier for the organization, and above all, all the attendees that uh, were patient until this time in the Friday afternoon. Uh, so now it's really, really weekend. So unless there are uh, questions or other topics, I close here the th this thematic session. And once again, thank you, everybody. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.